So we're continuing our journey with Jesus through the final week of his life leading up to his crucifixion. Uh, and last week we talked about his entry into Jerusalem and how that caused a stir. It caused a scene. It ruffled some feathers. And now we're going to kick it up a notch even more from last week. The story that we're going to look at today is pretty well known. There's actually, it's a two for one today. So two stories that are connected with one big idea, one big meaning that Jesus is going to show us. Um, but he's really going to like, you know, just make his detractors even more upset and almost intentionally in a way that we'll look at today. And so how we're going to apply that today is today I'm going to make this declaration. Okay. Today I'm losing my religion. Anybody know that song? Yeah. Right. I was going to say classic, but it's from the 90s, so it's not quite, because if the 90s are classic, that means that I'm classic, and I'm not quite that old yet, guys. And so, um, it's anyway, it's that song, but I'm, I'm going to make this declaration. I hope you'll join me that we can lose our religion together. We're going to look at one well-known story and make a comparison to maybe a lesser-known story that kind of gets lost in the middle of the, of the well-known story. But I hope that we can see it, and it's funny that Kim kind of prayed this at the end of worship, that we can see this story with fresh eyes today and really be encouraged and challenged uh, in our faith. So again, we looked at last week on Sunday, Palm Sunday, what we call it now, Jesus enters Jerusalem on the donkey. He makes this public declaration that he is, in fact, the king of the Jews. He is the, really the king of kings. So then after he does that, he, goes, he and his disciples, they're spending the night just out of town in Bethany. It's about two miles away. So they go back to Bethany uh, and stay there for the night. And then the next day, they get up and go back toward the temple. And so we're going to pick it up here and see what happens on this Monday, the last week of Jesus' life. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 11 uh, as our main text today. I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture, but we're in church. So I guess it's okay to do that in church, to read the Bible, you know. Uh, Mark 11, verse 15 is where we're going to start. So the day after... He goes in on the donkey. He comes back, and here's what happens. When they arrive back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. So I said he kicks it up a notch. Boy, does he ever. He's not coming in nicely on the donkey, you know, waving to the crowd like the queen or anything. Like he's making a mess. He's making a scene because he's making a point. And the point is taken because we saw last week the Pharisees, who are one sect of religious leaders, they're already plotting his crucifixion. They're already plotting his murder. But now after this, the leading priests, who are a different group, they're now on the same page. Typically, the leading priests are called the Sadducees. Maybe you've heard the Pharisees and Sadducees. Most of the leading priests are in this second group, the Sadducees. If you know anything about this context, Pharisees and Sadducees do not agree theologically. They don't agree on a lot of things. They don't work together very often. And so you know something's about to go down when they have the same goal in mind all of a sudden. When they have the same idea, ooh, let's kill Jesus. They're like, hey, that's a great idea, guys, we never agree with. You know something's about to go down, and just in a few days, it's going to go down. Let's look. I got a picture here of a rendering of the temple. This is the setting of our story today, just to give you an idea of uh, what it possibly sort of looked like. Now, we don't know because it was destroyed in 70 AD, but this is a, a pretty good rendering of the dimensions and the size. So this is actually the second temple in Jerusalem. The first temple we'll talk about briefly later on was built by King Solomon around 900 BC. It was destroyed by Babylon in 586 BC. So this is the second one um, built in the 530s BC. So by this time, it's been around for over 500 years. But within the last, you know, 50 years, King Herod has done a renovation project on the temple. So this is really called Herod's Temple. So this is the temple that Jesus would have grown up with. It's what he would have known. It's where he would have gone his whole life. This is what he would have, where he would have been. And also, if you remember, we've been in Acts this last year. In Acts 3, this is the same exact place where Peter and John heal a lame man at the entrance, one of these entrances to the temple. So a very well-known place. It covers about 41 acres of land. Lots of people come here. And as we've said, this particular week, the Passover week, there's about 2 million people crammed into this town of 80,000. Tons of people here, tons of activity, lots of stuff going on. And so Jesus shows up here, and he 
makes a mess, doesn't he? He turns over the tables. He, you know, the, there's another tra- another uh, gospel that says he, you know, whipped the animals out. Like there's a lot of stuff going on that Jesus does here. What's interesting, though, again, about the temple is Jesus has been here many times. So he's seen time after time after time probably the same money changers exchanging currency. He's probably seen the animals for sale in the entrance courts of the temple. So why now, on this day, at this time, does he now choose to make this move? Wouldn't he done this years and years ago? Well, it's possible he did it earlier in his ministry. We don't know if there's two times he did this, but we know he does it here near the end of his life. And I think the reason he does this now is because of his sense of timing. Jesus had this sense of timing with him. He knows that his list of enemies is growing rapidly. He knows his time's getting short. He's got, if he's going to make this move, he's got to make it now. He knows that things are falling into place, and he has this sense if, if I can time this just right, it's going to coincide with what God, the cosmic plan, is going to be. And so he kind of has this, things are setting into motion here. And so he turns over the tables, whips the animals, and makes this scene. But really, he's not making a mess. He's making a point. He's teaching us a lesson. And so we're going to lose our religion today because Jesus is telling us two things, two negative things about religion that I think that we can apply to our lives and our faith, to negative things about religion, really what it does and what it is at its core and why it's not helpful. And that may not make sense, but hopefully uh, you, you haven't cut me off yet by saying, oh, what do you mean lose my religion? No, no, just hang with me. We'll, we'll get there. Let's look first. What Jesus does here, he shows us what religion does. And at its core, at its essence, religion uses. Religion uses. So very obviously, very clearly, the religious leaders are using Judaism. They're using their faith for their own purpose, for their own gain, right? It's a business plan for them. It's developed into something. It's warped into something that it wasn't intended to be, and that's the point that Jesus is making. Now, some will use this story. Just Let me just step outside and be Pastor Stephen for just a second, right, even though I already am, and it, just in a different way. Some people use this story to say, see, you shouldn't take up offerings at church. Jesus would turn your tables over. No, it's not the same thing, okay? So get your offering envelopes out right now. You know, no, 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 no. Get your checkbooks out. No. But there is a temple tax that in the Gospels Jesus pays. There are tithes and offering mentioned Old Testament that Jesus in the New Testament affirms. So it's not that, ch- now, no, I'm not going to go. I didn't write that down, so I'm not going to say it because I will regret it because this is, you know, I shouldn't say that. Um, maybe you can know where I'm going to go with that. Maybe you don't. I don't here, it's okay. But th- here's the real problem that Jesus is showing us here. The people, especially those that are out of town, which is most of the people, they're not just paying the temple tax, which is fine. They're not, they're not just paying their tithe, which is fine. It's, an, it's scriptural, but they're being charged an exchange rate for their foreign currency. And the people that are doing this, they've set up a lucrative business. They can charge exorbitant rates on this exchange because you've got to have the temple currency to buy this animal that's required to sacrifice in the temple. They're extorting God's people. That's what these corrupt leaders are doing. That's the problem that Jesus has, is you've turned this sacred place of prayer and worship into a business. You, you're extorting God's people because they're traveling from a long way. They're, they can't bring an animal sacrifice with them. So they have to purchase one in Jerusalem because they're required to make the sacrifice in the temple. And so now they are in a corner. They have to pay the exchange rate they really can hardly afford to put in the pockets of the leading priests who are corrupt because they, they're being extorted. It's clearly a, a scheme. It's maybe a pyramid scheme or some kind of a scheme. It's a temple scheme, okay? Yeah, that was for you. <laughs> so it, it's an extortion scheme from the people. And so in turning over the tables and making this scene, Jesus is underscoring this point. But it's a greater point. It's the big issue he's had with these corrupt leaders all along. So in Matthew 23, which happens actually the next, the next day after this, he goes back to teach in the temple. Here's what he says to the crowd, okay? <laughs> Matthew 23, verse 1. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. So Jesus literally here says, do as they say, not as they do. 
which it seems weird, but that's what he's saying. They're speaking the law. The law is not the problem. It's their inner corruption that is crushing you that is the problem that Jesus has. They're using their religion to oppress, crush, and control people, which is honestly the opposite of their job. Their job is to help people in need, to uplift them, to teach them the truth of who God is. And that's why the, the half-brother of Jesus, James, in his letter, he says, true religion is helping orphans and widows in their distress. They're doing the opposite of that. And they think that they're the right in the right. They think that they're the ones that are holy and God loves us because we're the important people. And Jesus turns the tables literally and figuratively on, in, on them and says, that's not how this works at all. You're totally backwards in your thinking. However, we can be guilty. I mentioned this last week, but I'll say it again. We can be guilty of having a similar spiritual attitude. We can use religion to oppress people. We can use it as a weapon on people. And here's what Jesus says about that in Matthew 7, part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you'll be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. If we're not careful, even devoted followers of Jesus can use religion in this way as a weapon to cut people down. They don't measure up to my standards, so they're not good enough. Or they don't do things the way that I would, and so God's not pleased with them, but he is with me because I'm doing it the right way, right? And so we see that if we're not careful. And it seems reasonable to me, but in reality, it's ridiculous. And to show you how ridiculous it is, uh, Kim's going to help me with this, uh, this little uh, object lesson here. So just to let you know, this is Kim's sin, okay, <laughs> right here. And this is mine. This is my sin, Okay, see that? See how that works? Hey, Kim. Hey. How you doing? I haven't seen you for a while. How's it going? It's, it's going all right. Yeah, you doing well? Yeah, doing good. yeah, how's life? Okay, wait. Okay, guys, listen. Do you see how sinful she is? Did you see that? Like, she's got this thing sticking out of her eye. It's so annoying. Like, I can't believe that she lives the way she does and she calls herself a Christian. I think I'm going to try to help her and we'll see. We'll just see, you know, how, how that kind of goes, okay? Okay, cool. So anyway, um, hey, I've, I've had this concern for a while. Uh, and I mean this, you know, uh, genuinely from my heart. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks. That's really heavy. Um, you just have a lot of sin in your life. I just got to call it out. Just got to call it like it is. I'm just being honest, you know. I'm not, I'm not judging you. But, man, you've got some stuff going on. Like that relationship you're in, it's kind of sinful, like, I, you know, my neighbor told me, I, we haven't talked for a while, but my neighbor kind of told me what you were doing last weekend. Okay. I mean, I just got to call it out. Okay, well, and you know, what's really disappointing, Kim, is that you call yourself a Christian. And I'm living for Jesus, and I, I'm trying to serve him, and I just see you, and it's just not a good look. So, I mean, I would, if we want to get together, I would love to maybe have you talk to my pastor, and uh, he can help you with some of your issues and problems and hang-ups and stuff like that. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds, yeah, good. That sounds great. Ah! <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah, give her a hand. Yeah, good job, good job, good job. No people were harmed in the making of that skit. You know, I had to put that disclaimer on there. So do you see how, again, that's a very silly illustration, but that's how silly it, it is spiritually. When I use religion as a weapon to judge someone else based on my, even if I judge them based on God's standard, my ultimate, now, we, we can work together as brothers and sisters in Christ to help each other grow, and iron sharpens iron, Proverbs says. There's a place for that, but there's a different feeling, isn't there? Like, you, you probably know when you've kind of gone too far on the judgment zone area, and so we want to be careful that we're not living this way because religion is not a weapon. In fact, it's an invitation. That's the distinction that Jesus makes. It's an invitation. Jesus says this in Matthew 11. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Isn't that a much better option that Jesus offers than the way some people use religion? Than the way sometimes I am tempted to use religion? So when he turns the tables over in the temple, he's saying you're seeing it completely wrong. You're seeing it totally backwards. You've been using your religion as a weapon, but I came to give you a new way of life. 
you, you're weary and carrying burdens, and you're putting burdens on other people, making them weary, but I've come to give you freedom from that. Religion is not the answer, Jesus says. I am the answer. So religion uses, if we're not careful. The other thing, though, that religion can do is that not only does it, it, is it religion uses, but that religion is useless. That's what Jesus shows us here in this story. Jesus does this thing at the temple to show a bigger spiritual point, and in case it went over their heads or didn't make any sense, there's actually a, a, an occasion that happens right before this moment and a thing that happens right after that show the spiritual truth of this. So this is the second story that we'll cover for just a little bit this morning. So on their way into the temple, he hasn't overturned the money changers' tables yet. He hasn't done that yet. But on the way in that morning, we're going to be at Mark 11, verse 12. The next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off, so he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. So they, they're walking to the temple Monday morning. He sees the fig tree not bearing fruit. He curses the fig tree. They go to the temple. He overturns the money changers' tables, makes this big scene. And then after that, here's what happens. Pick it up at verse 19 of Mark 11. That evening, Jesus and his, and his disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that, if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying... First, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. So what Jesus does here with this fruitless fig tree is show the spiritual application of what he did in the temple on that Monday. He's showing that religion in and of itself for the purpose of religion is useless. It's fruitless. It's empty. It's dead. That's what he's showing. So it's funny, though, again, and there's a thing that jumps out here, too. In verse 13, Mark says, well, it wasn't the season for fruit yet, but so why would Jesus curse this fig tree if it's not in season? Why, why would he be mad? Well, why, why would he be expecting fruit if it's not time? Well, what it shows, though, is, remember, the, he went over to this one fig tree because it had leaves. So typically what's going on here is there would be early bloomers that would produce figs. So what's happening here is this tree has the leaves, to show signs of growth and fruitfulness and maturity. But when he goes over, there's no fruit. So he curses the tree. That's the spiritual point, and that's why he curses the tree. The lesson here is that the tree had the appearance of fruit, but no actual fruit. The spiritual lesson is that the tree had promised goods, but didn't deliver on its promise. This is a typical imagery for the Old Testament, too, for Israel. The fig tree was big. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, all these prophets, they talk about if the fig tree is fruitful and healthy, that means Israel's doing good. God's pleased. They're, everything's just rolling along. But there are times where God will use imagery of the fig tree that's dried up, that's fruitless, that's dying, and this is not what's coming next after this analogy from the prophets. It's usually not a good thing for the nation of Israel. And so they probably understand this connection from this, these Old Testament prophets as well. And this, again, as he does this to show his inner 12, the spiritual point from the temple, he's also saying the same thing he said all along about empty, useless religion. Again, Matthew 23, we looked at this earlier. Let's look at a few verses later at the end of the chapter. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. So Jesus is saying to these empty religious people, it's all style and no substance. It's a bunch of leaves, but no actual fruit. And he uses this tree to illustrate this spiritual point. So the, the cursing of the fig tree is connected to Jesus when he goes in and says, this is a house of prayer, 
but you've made it a den of thieves. Jeremiah actually used that same term in one of his prophecies in Jeremiah chapter 7. He, t- he goes into the temple, and there's corruption happening in the temple. There's idol worship happening in the temple uh, in Jeremiah's day, and he says, this is a den of thieves. Jesus borrows that language from Jeremiah and says the same thing. Your practice of religion is useless. It does you no good. It does no one any good. So we have, we, it's kind of like pretending, but it's not anything in reality. So that's the danger of religion, but there's a connection for the next few minutes. Let's look at this connection, though. There's an alternative that Jesus offers. And maybe you can already guess where I'm going with this. It's a pretty common way of looking at life and faith. But it's not religion. It's relationship. That's the alternative that Jesus offers us, apart from a useless, dead religion that can manipulate people and twist their arm and judge them and beat them down. He offers instead relationship that does the two opposite things that religion does. So let's look quickly for a few minutes at at this connection here. So if religion uses, relationship gives. Does the exact opposite of what religion does. And Jesus never directly states this connection, but it's kind of obvious, so he doesn't really have to say it in these terms, because the temple was designed to promote this giving way of life. The whole point of the temple was to show this physical relationship between God and his people. And they come together in relationship to worship God in a relational way. We mentioned at the beginning when we looked at the picture of the second temple, when Solomon dedicated the first, King Solomon dedicated the first temple, he had this large prayer uh, that he, when he dedicated it, and I want to read part of it to you because it brings this relational part of God out of it. This is 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 41 through 43, and here's part of Solomon's prayer that shows the relational nature of God that's available to us. Solomon says, In the future, foreigners who do not belong to your people Israel will hear of you. They will come from distant lands because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your powerful arm. And when they pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven where you live and grant what they ask of you. In this way, all the people of the earth will come to know and fear you just as your own people Israel do. They too will know that this temple I have built honors your name. The idea of the temple, the Old Testament temple, is a relational place. It's not a place where we come and do our religious duty or our empty religious uh, obligation. It's a, it's a relational place. Um, it's the heart behind the temple is this physical representation of the relational nature between God and his people. And what Solomon says is even outsiders who aren't part of this relationship yet are going to want that relationship. They're going to long for that relationship because most other gods of this ancient culture are not nice. Like if you read the other myths of other ancient peoples and the gods that they served, their gods were out to get them all the time. We're always to be afraid of these gods all the time. They're going to use us and manipulate us all the time. But this, this nation's God seems to really like love his people. He seems to really want to enter into a relationship with them, like he really likes spending time with them. That's the differentiating factor between God and any other worldview, is that God is a God of love. Jeremiah 31, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. John 3, Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave. Relationship gives. 1 John chapter 4, John simply says, God is love. It's not even that God loves, it's that that's who he is. That's his nature is love. And in Romans uh, chapter 8, Paul says, if God didn't spare his own son for us, won't he give us everything else that we need? This relational nature is all about God giving to his people. It's not about him, you know, trying to push us down. It's not about him telling us to push others down. It's not about us trying to measure up with this empty, useless, fruitless religion. It's this life-giving relationship that we can have with God. That's what God desires. And the challenge then is that we would live that out. We would live that giving relationship type of life out. I want to read this. It's, it's a little bit long. I was going to skip it, but it, it's, it makes a good point. Um, no, I, I am going to skip it. Because no, I'm not going to skip it. Sorry. Never mind. I talk myself in and out of it. It's just one of those days. I don't know what's going on. So this is Mark 12. This is this, the, the day after this temple clearing when he's teaching. This is part of the teachings uh, of Jesus. And here's what happens. Mark 12, 28. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked Jesus of all the commandments, which is the most important? Again, he's, ta- he's religious talk, religious jargon. What do I have to do to get in? How can God be pleased with me? What functions can I do for him to be happy? 
And Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. You must love the Lord your God. That's relational with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Relational. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law replied, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This guy's finally getting it. Empty religion gets me nowhere. Checking off the to-dos of faith. Now, there are things that are required of us in our faith, but it's relational in nature. There's a deeper, more personal purpose to my faith than just doing the right things or being the right kind of person God wants me to be. It's relational in nature. It's not about religion, but relationship. It's not about rules, but relationship. It's not about what God can do for me, but what God can do through me relationally. It's not about what God can do for me, but what I can do for others relationally. Relation, religion uses, it's me focused, but relationship gives, it's others focused. Here's the last thing as we close this morning. It's the religion is useless, but relationship grows. Relationship grows. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it wasn't bearing fruit. It was useless. If you're a fig tree, you have one job to do. You ever heard that phrase before? You had one job. If you can't do it, it, the tree is cursed. It's useless. It's empty, performative, manipulative. Religion does the same thing. The Pharisees, the corrupt Pharisees were fruitless, dead, and useless. But a healthy relationship with God through Christ grows, matures, flourishes, and makes an impact. And it starts with us. It's the fruit that we produce. This is what Galatians 5 says. Galatians 5.22, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. You see, when I live a life of religion, here's what, I, here's what I'm doing. I'm white-knuckling my faith. I have to be better. I have to do more. Oh, I love this life of religion. It is so enjoyable to me. Yay, you know. But too often we try to do that, and that's why people flake out. That's why it doesn't last. That's why there's no growth. Because the results are up to me. I have to perform for this God in the universe somewhere. I've got to be the right kind of person because he said so, because the Bible says so. But if we can see it in terms of relationship over empty religion, what does it say there? The Holy Spirit produces this spiritual fruit. It's him working with me. Now, there are things that are asked of me to grow, certainly, but the Holy, as I'm rooted in Christ and the Holy Spirit waters me, I will grow in relationship. It's not up to me just to be the right kind of person, follow all the rules, all the regulations. No, it's about a relationship with a relational God. That's who he longs to be. He produces that fruit so we can grow and make a difference. And it's like the temple. Remember the physical temple when Solomon prayed? He wanted the temple to attract people to it, to see this relationship work the way it's designed, to say, I want in on that. That's what my life as the temple, your life as the temple of the Holy Spirit should also do, to see the power of that relational nature that one can have with God and others say, I don't know what that is. I don't know how you have that peace in your life, but I need that. I don't know how you're so full of joy despite what you're facing, but I, I need that. I don't know how you can just believe things that are impossible, and yet it always come, God always comes through. I need that. That's what our life should look like. One more scripture as we close, and I'm going to do something that I've only, I can count on one hand the number of times that I've read from the message translation. It's, it's a fine translation. It's got its, you know, it's got its things, but I don't use it a lot. But I love the way that this verse is, is quoted here. So I want to read this, and then, and then we'll close in prayer here in just a second. This is 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18, and it perfectly describes what we've been talking about today. So here's what it says. Whenever, though, they turn to face God as Moses did, God removes the veil, and there they are face to face. That's relational. They suddenly recognize that God is a living personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. 
And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it. All of us. Nothing between us and God. Our faces shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured, much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. That's the goal. You can't do that with empty religion. It doesn't get you there. Only a living relationship with God can get you where you need to go. Following the rules aren't enough. It's useless. It's fruitless. But if we can live within that relationship with God and grow and flourish and make that impact God wants us to make, that's what the whole point of this thing is all about. So today I'm losing my religion. It's useless. It's fruitless. It doesn't, ha- it doesn't have any point at all. So I'm throwing that away and I'm trading that in for a living, fruitful relationship with God that can change everything in the world. Let's pray today. God, we we pray that we would see this today, see the dichotomy here between empty, useless, fruitless religion that just follows the rules and checks the boxes, and instead you offer this vibrant, fruitful, amazing relationship with the living, present God. Help us to trade our religion. I'm losing my religion, and I'm trading it in for a relationship with God. I thank you today that we are losing our religion. We're saying no to just rule keeping and doing the right thing and checking the boxes and fitting in, you know, your parameters. And we're saying, no, God, I want a relationship that is wild and free and vibrant and all that you have for me. And I want it to affect me in such a way that I grow and flourish and impact those around me so they can connect to you and grow and flourish spiritually themselves. That's what it's all about. Help us to live that way, free of empty, dead, useless religion into this life-giving, life-altering relationship with you. We thank you and praise you for this new way of life that hopefully we see as we leave this place today, live that way this week, and just see what awesome things are in store for us in the coming days. I pray your blessing upon all those here today. You keep them safe as we leave this place and bring us back next time ready for more of you. In Jesus' name, amen.